All right, welcome to the Benson Podcast. Here we go. Today we're going to talk about Iran. We're looking at uh, part four for those of you who are joining us in the middle. And today we're going to talk about, first of all, political conflict and competition. Here you see the Supreme Leader voting, as indeed even the Supreme Leader does in fact vote. Uh, we're going to really start by looking at the electoral system. Remember that Iran is all about this mix of elements of democracy and uh, uh, non-democratic or undemocratic um, positions. And so this is a great chart, like some of the other charts that we've seen, that shows you elected versus unelected. We really want to make sure that you're clear on which positions are elected. You see it on the left, the president, the assembly of experts, and the parliament or the majlis. These are the elected ones. They are um, carefully vetted elections, right? It's the council of guardians. It gets to oversee all the details of the election run from within the government. Um, but in general, it's single member district, uh, majority vote, so you often have runoff elections. Anybody over the age of 18, as of 2005, can vote. Elections are also what we call nonpartisan, so you're voting for people, not parties. And we'll get into the complexities of the party system in just a moment. Um, one of the things, oh, also I'll mention that voter turnout has really gone way down, except for some of the presidential elections when the people who are looking for reform will sort of unite around one candidate. But in 2004, we had 25% voter turnout. Uh, the evolution of electoral competition. Um, obviously, during the um, Shah of Iran, we didn't have any parties. We had an authoritarian dictatorship. But the new constitution, the Constitution of 79, uh, Article 26, does allow for uh, the freedom of parties. Um, but it's a confusing system. Really, what's going on here is... Uh, in the beginning, we have this early flurry of parties, hundreds of parties. Some of the famous ones, we have the Tudi party, that's the Communist Party, the Mujahideen, which was a radical Islamic Marxist party. Uh, and then very quickly, you have the forming of two major movements. You have the IRP, the Islamic Republican Party, that was uh, Khomeini's group. And then you have the Liberation Movement, which was the pro-democracy, pro-Western um, movement. Um, and, and then we start to see... Uh, repression and arrests and executions, uh, the 1981 party law, which will specify that parties have to get permission from the interior ministry. Um, we don't necessarily see a banning of the parties, but we see a reducing of the parties. By 84, it's like all there is is the IRP. Uh, and then in 1987, the Ayatollah asks that the IRP be uh, dismantled. And so there's, in a sense, no parties. And then there's a whole bunch of parties. In today's current Iran, there's like 60 to 100 different parties, but they're not parties like we think of in the West. There's some confusion in the understanding of these parties because while no Western political scientists are allowed to study in Iran still to this day, um, but you have the, the, these different parties. When there's a presidential election, you have a lot of them. In fact, candidates, rather than paying to run, like in Nigeria, they are paid to run. And so that's part of the reason why we'll see so many candidates. Um, we... Today, there's two major alliances, a conservative alliance and a reformist alliance, and, and I'll get into those in a minute, but let's talk about the rise and fall of reform. Um, what we're looking at, well, first, if we can make a comparison to China and Russia, we know that in China, um, there was radical economic reform without political reform. In Russia, we had uh, economic reform and political reform. Some like to say that in Iran, we have neither economic or political reform. However, there is a lot of talk of political reform, uh, sorry, economic reform, but very little talk on the political side. Um, so let's now look at uh, the, the ideologies and the different ideologies that we're going to see uh, in the Iranian political sphere. Uh, the conservatives. Who are the conservatives? Well, the conservatives sometimes are the ones that we refer to as the hardliners, the ones who dominate, the Ayatollah, the supreme leader, hardcore uh, clerics. Um, they have something of a party. They have the, I think it's called the, um, the um, Repub conservative Republican <clears throat> Uh, clerical party or something like that. Uh, but there isn't really like one strong party like in Russia or in Nigeria. You don't really have that system. You have this, this core of control. Um, within the conservative movement, though, you also have what we call the quietist approach. This is an idea that faith really should be more of an intermediary between the state and society. It's so somewhat opposed to the, the idea of the guardianship of the jurist. They would like to keep religion out of politics to avoid the corrupting factor. Uh, a lot of these guys end up actually becoming more of the reformists, right? Uh, and that brings us, of course, next to the idea of the reformists. Who are these guys? What do they stand for? Fundamentally, reformists are about economics. They support free markets. They support private property, better relations with the West. Uh, they would like to stop the nuclear program because that's what's led to the uh, sanctions against Iran. Um, and that 
concept. But very importantly, they, the reformists tend to support the Islamic Revolution. We're not talking about the constitutional reformists uh, that would go back to like you know the Mossadegh era or the 1905 Constitution era. We're talking about today's modern Iranian reformists. Uh, and these guys really get their beginning um, are seen as their highlight is from 97 to 2005 under President Khatami, who we're learning a lot about through the list, uh, Lipstick Jihad. Another name for their movement was the Second Kordad Front, or the Servants of the Construction Party. Um, I don't know that you need to remember those particular names. Uh, here's a great old picture of Rouhani, or the other way around, Khatami and Rouhani, uh, who's now the current president, uh, although he's not considered a reformist. He's considered a moderate, um, although on his uh, Twitter page he does... We'll go back to that for a second. Support one of his few friends uh, or, or um, followers, right? people that he follows on Twitter, is Katami. What that means, I, I can't tell you. Um, the reformist movement starts to get its full swing, but in the middle of that, you do have the student uprising. The 1999 student uprising, I won't go into too much detail, but it was considered the most turbulent times in Iran since 1979's uprising. Uh, it's 20 years in. They were calling it Iran's second revolution, but there's a really tough crackdown. You see a picture here of a Iranian university dorm, very harsh, lots of arrests, uh, torture, death, all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, I believe I've read somewhere that Rouhani was one of the guys who ordered the police to crack down. Um, so that really shows him more of a moderate, not a reformist, right? Um, out of the student uprising and out of the f moving into further politics, we see the biggest uprising, maybe in some ways as big as 79, although it is also uh, a failure, and that is the Green Movement or the Revolution of 2009. This comes out of the 09 election when this gentleman here, Mir Hussein Musavi, only gets 33% of the vote to Ahmadinejad's 62% of the vote, uh, and people take to the streets. It's been referred to as the Twitter Revolution uh, because not only did the politicians, but also the people use Twitter to organize themselves. This is Musavi's page. Um, these guys end up going under house arrest, and then all of a sudden we've got a major movement. Marches in the streets, three million people taking to the streets, uh, turns violent, protests, crackdown, arrests, torture, death, destruction. Uh, there's a real challenge uh, onto the election. Here's a cartoon making fun of the so-called Iranian recount where the police are just beating everybody as they vote the second time. Um, big mess, but somehow the Iranian government weathers the storm. Ahmadinejad serves a whole nother term. Uh, and then we move into um, the most recent election, which you can see in your notes there, 2013, where a centrist, Rouhani, not a reformer, um, but who seems to support the reformers. And in fact, the re reason he wins is because the reformers come uh, behind him almost 100%. And I put in your notes here the election turnout results. But now we turn to a new topic, civil society. Um, we've talked about it in other countries. I just want to remind you of the definition, the realm of social life in which uh, when viewed from the perspective of government, is characterized by plural and particularistic identities. Uh, put more simply, it's the political parties, interest groups, clubs, congregations, corporations. It's all these different groups and associations, generally outside of government, which people belong to, right? Um, so what about Iran? Well, the good news in Iran is that it's this most active civil society that we see in the Muslim world, all right? Put a question mark there. Uh, because what do we mean by this? Um, uh, and, and they're in a region that doesn't have a lot of civil society, and Iran will have an increase and then again a decrease in that sort of positive. But what we do know is that civic activism is quite widespread. I put a little quote here in your notes that talks about a variety of the different groups and how important uh, civic activism is. Clearly the reformist years are the heyday. That's when people were given the most freedom to get active and participate. You can see some details in the long quote I put in your notes, we have women's rights groups, we have social groups, we have environmental groups, we have labor groups, all kinds of things going on, and a booming population of non-governmental organizations. It's an exciting time. Uh, also, the internet, of course, will become a critical part of what we talk about in civil society. Um, oops, we're going to go right back to there. Um, we also, though, see decrease in civil society. There's this concept known as the Ummah, that's the Islamic community. According to the the hardliners, there needs not be any activity outside of the Ummah. And so you have an idea of everything should be controlled and dominated by the Islamic State. And we start to see what they call counterfeit civil society, the government trying to create opportunities for civil society. Um, so we see a decrease, um, but then the Green Movement and the Twitter Revolution shows us uh, that it is yet still there and strong, right? People want reform, even if it's not necessarily revolution, people are demanding. Let's talk about journalism and the Internet. 
Here you see a cyber cafe. Um, there is a new law since 2012 that cyber cafes have to check everybody's identity. There's been, uh, like I said in earlier, a major crackdown on the freedom of the internet, trying to really keep Iranians, especially since the green movement, from having access to Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Uh, most of the media is state controlled. Um, however, there's been some opening and people can have iPhones and Android phones and, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, there's a great little quote there in your notes about budgetary problems and uh, other issues of freedom going on in Iran. And yet there was an announcement just this year that Iran fulfilled its dream of creating a base in Antarctica. Hmm, that seems really important. Um, anyways, talking about the Internet Civil Society recently when the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu made a comment about um, not wearing jeans in Iran. Somebody posted this on their Twitter, a girl who's wearing her blue jeans as the police officer in blue jeans chases him. So sort of admitting, yeah, we've got problems in Iran, but our problems aren't blue jeans. And there were literally tens of thousands of tweets about blue jeans in Iran. Uh, so that showed the vibrancy of the response to Netanyahu's comment. Um, I really like this one too. This was an online um, protest movement that was in response to the latest election, Vote for Zara. Zara was a character from a cartoon or a graphic novel about the Green Movement. And so here you see an Iranian woman uh, posing in front of a statement that says, I have a right to free and fair elections. And uh, she's, of course, also wearing her blue jeans. So uh, young people in Iran were posting this all over the place, asking for change, just not mentioning uh, their full name so that they could get arrested, uh, couldn't get arrested. Um, the current leadership loves the internet. Here's Rouhani's Facebook page. Um, and here's uh, Rouhani. And, and even the Ayatollah, even the Supreme Leader has his own Twitter feed, right? But the people can't use Twitter. Uh, I thought this one was pretty hilarious. The Khamenei should check it out. He, he just likes to tweet all these things about how great Iran is and how we're going to just destroy the West. Um, you can see this huge march of people, and he's saying that it's a demonstration against hostile U.S. policies. Well, maybe that's what it was. I don't know. Uh, and, and then Rouhani's also got some funny language in his. If anyone harbors illusions that they can threaten Iran, they need new glasses. On no table exists military option against our nation. Okay. Way to go, Rouhani. Sure. Um, anything else to add about that? Um, I think we're good. And I mentioned earlier the September 13, 2013 accident where they opened up the internet and then they quickly reclosed it. Oh, well. Um, society. Let's talk about society in Iran. Uh, ethnic identity and cleavages. So um, remember that Iran is predominantly Shia. Uh, 89%, 90%, right? But we also have the Persian versus Arab conflict. We don't definitely don't have a lot of Sunni. <clears throat> But we do, as you can see from this map, have a great deal of diversity. There is the large Azeri population. You have your Kurdish population. Oops. You have um, all kinds of different groups. You can see on the side there, Baloch and Lur and uh, Galaki and Talish and Turkmen, and it goes on and on. And it leads to some really interesting conflicts. Uh, my favorite one to look at is the Azerbaijan and Armenia issue. Um, so... Azeris make up about 25% of Iran. The Persians are a bare majority, right? Um, the, the Azeris speak this Turkic language, and the Iranians really see the Azeris as something as a threat because there's this call for pan-Azeri nationalism. Azerbaijan would like to see the Iranian Azeris working with them. Um, and so Iran actually in the 90s supports Christian Armenians who are fighting against Muslim, uh, Muslims in Azerbaijan. So you have a very odd situation there of the Islamic State supporting a Christian group against another Islamic State. Um, as they say, power politics and nationalism trumps religious solidarity. Uh, there's also been Kurdish, Kurdish issues as well, like in the 79 Republic. Um, public policy, we're going to have three major issues that we're going to try to tackle. Subsidies, birth control and family planning, and the issue of uh, some environmental issues. So if we can dive right in, we'll talk about um, the subsidies, right? What was covered? Subsidies in Iran included things like uh, low prices for petrol, gas, electricity, flour, oil. It was really meant to help the urban population. And you can see in the chart here that Iran had the highest amount of subsidies of any country in the world, actually. An incredible amount of subsidies. It was costing them a lot. It was also leading to a lot of corruption. $100 billion a year. It was 10% of government expenses. And they just last year pretty much announced that they were going to be cutting these subsidies, right? And they had to make a requirement that you couldn't just raise prices. They were worried that people, because everything was more expensive for everybody, it would lead to inflation. So the government says no price raising, and they're going to police the streets and the stores and make sure it doesn't happen, uh, which, of course, led to a taxi strike. The taxi drivers were on strike in Tehran because they needed to raise prices. They couldn't afford to drive for the same amount because gas prices were going up. Um, there was this policy of handouts. Money went into people's banks to help them deal with the higher prices. Um, 
Uh, now the, that's been replaced with the handing out of just food baskets because people literally can't afford to feed their families anymore. And so the government opens these uh, offices around town where they're handing out food. You can see the lines of people getting ready to get their petrol. Um, yeah, $100 billion a year. This is a cartoon sort of making fun of the petrol issue, and it shows Ahmadinejad pouring oil. When instead of helping the problem, he's about to in make the problem worse. Uh, so far, it has been difficult, but it's hard to tell what's really going on with the subsidies issue because the uh, real big issue right now, of course, is the sanctions, and that has really hit Iran quite hard. Uh, population growth issues is a really interesting topic. Birth control and family planning in Iran. We have this interesting situation where population is booming in early Islamic Republic Iran, right? And especially due to the Iran-Iraq war. The Ayatollah thought we needed a big population. We needed a lot of massive growth so that we had more people to fight. But then they started seeing the economic costs of having a large and young population. And so they decided to launch a major program to work on decreasing population. And we actually end up seeing one of the most successful population uh, control or family planning programs, is a better way to put it, uh, programs around the world, especially in the developing world. Um, they pass a family planning law, which encourages the reductions in family size. But what really works is the state-controlled media campaigns to raise awareness. They send women out across the countryside, all over the country, education, um, access to birth control, state-sanctioned condom factories. These things play a really important role. Mandatory marital sex counseling for men and women, educating how to avoid pregnancy, unwanted pregnancies. And it really leads to a significant and dramatic change, which leads us to the question of what are some of the social and economic consequences of this shift. It's an aging population. Some of the problems that the Western world are facing, that might be the negative, but Iran's not really there yet. What they're really seeing is it's probably helping the economy because you don't have this massive young population right now. It's usually been uh, touted as a pretty popular and successful and good thing that the Iranian government has done. We can also talk environment real quick. Uh, what are some of the environmental issues? It, their dependence on oil is a big one. Uh, there's extreme issues of pollution in Tehran, deforestation, desertification, water contamination, and the drying up of lakes and rivers and water sources. And then, of course, the nuclear power issues. They want to create nuclear power, and the West is opposed because we're afraid that they'll use it to weaponize. Um, who in Iran would deal, this was a question we asked about China, with the environmental issues? Well, obviously, the Supreme Leader and the President, they're the most powerful positions in the country. They can disagree with each other, and the Supreme Leader tends to win on that. The Majlis, the Parliament, can pass laws dealing with environmental regulation and so on and so forth. Uh, the Guardian Council could also choose to get involved. Iran has environmental NGOs, environmental interest groups. The United Nations might tell Iran they need to do this, that, or the other thing. So all of these different groups in one way or another can find themselves being involved. And the last thing I want to cover before we move on is just a quick review of the concept of the rentier state. We saw this in Nigeria. I think it's really important that we uh, make sure we got the definition down because we've got two key rentier states that we study in this class, uh, Iran, Nigeria, well, really three because we have to throw Russia in there as well. A little bit different than the first two, though. Uh, Rent-seeking, I'll remind you, is the idea of getting your income from property uh, or investments, uh, the idea of obtaining revenue from your natural resources. Usually foreign companies are, are, are doing that, although in Iran, not the case because they nationalize the oil. Uh, a rentier state is a state or a country that obtains its income by exporting its raw materials or leasing out those resources to foreign countries. So both can count, right? They obtain most of their revenue from oil or another key resource. In the case of Iran and Nigeria, they're both oil, right? Receiving significant amount of their income from foreign companies, that's more Nigeria. Iran is this idea of just from its natural resources. Um, a rentier economy as opposed to a rentier state is an economy that is supported by state spending, state expenditure uh, based on its rents from abroad. Typically, these states, like Nigeria, like Iran, tend to abandon the agricultural sectors, abandon small-scale production, uh, they often work with the import substitution idea, which uh, usually has led to, to catastrophic economic results. Um, all kinds of problems come out of this rentier state idea. Some of these we saw in Nigeria that should be review. You have an uh, uh, economy that's not diversified. You have dependency on world prices. You have the lack of incentive to industrialize or modernize. You have increased corruption. You have the total lack of accountability to citizens. That idea of no representation without taxation. Flip the famous American slogan on its head. Um, Iran is a classic rentier state. Oil represents 90% of the wealth, right? They have 7% of the world's oil reserves and they have the second largest natural gas reserves in the world. And so oil is a big part of understanding Iran, 
right? Uh, we mentioned import substitution. That's the idea of replacing all the stuff that you uh, buy from abroad with local goods. Uh, that is especially becomes important to Iran um, because of, uh, if you skip down to where it says autarky, the idea of autarky is creating independence, economic independence, trying to cut yourself off from the world. It's never really worked well anywhere. Um, sometimes it becomes necessary because of war and because of subsidies and things like that, but it's led, in the case of Iran, to a seriously devastated economy with massive, massive unemployment, 40% below the poverty line, and so on and so forth. And we are going to stop there, and thank you very much, and we'll see you later.